the iOS 14 sky is falling, or is it? Hello and welcome to Retention Masterclass. My name is John Kutzir. And my name is Peggy Ann Saltz, and we are, as always, co-hosts on your show. Absolutely. As always. Well, we've been doing as always, forever. We're, we're, we're getting up to episode <laughs> 20, John. And this was an, an initially just because we were thrilled about the topic. And now that it's like, is true. It's the real that deal. That is true. Yes. Great well, to be a pioneer. <laughs> well, as every mobile marketer on the planet knows, iOS 14 will, in effect, deprecate the IDFA by making it opt-in. So the IDFA is going the way of the dodo bird, that mobile identifier that marketers use. And of course, uh, the dodo bird, as well as a third party cookie, the Google ad ID might follow in a year or so. Yeah, it's looking pretty possible. And that of course means measurement. Yeah, marketing measurement is fundamentally changing. Granular to aggregate, user level to device specific, to general, to who knows? That's why we're here on the show. Literally, who knows? Well, you know what? I think we have some ideas and we might have a guest who has some more, at least we hope so. That's why we have them on the show. The question is, what does this all mean for optimization, for cohorts, for LTV calculations, for all the data and metrics that marketers have been using for the past few years? And that's why we have them, right? We have Brian Krebs. He has spent almost a decade, well, actually most of a decade, building solutions for measurement for mobile marketers. Here's what I like, John. He's on a mission to measure, right? <laughs> so with that in mind, we have high expectations, no pressure. Brian, welcome to Retention Masterclass. Thanks so much, John and Peggy. It's really great to be here. Awesome. It's great to have you. Brian, we're going to jump right into it. Um, IDFA deprecation is having and will have massive consequences for marketers. What's the biggest change that you see? Yeah, it's just so when IDFA disappears, devices go dark almost essentially on day one. So uh, this early next year time frame, when this privacy update rolls out for iOS 14, devices go dark almost on day one in terms of tracking. So yeah. you still have your IDFVs as long as as an app developer, you have taken the time this time right now to refactor a lot of your code, a lot of your internal app analytics and business intelligence to make sure you're focused on IDFVs. You're still OK from an app analytics standpoint. But in terms of marketing, uh, we're, we're really focused on tracking. And that means understanding which devices are in which apps across app developers, uh, app developer accounts and in the in the terms of the the iOS iTunes store, so um, when that happens, a lot of things kind of fall. Uh, definitely retargeting. You can't understand users in your app unless you know the IDs, and those IDs are consistent in, in other apps, right? So retargeting falls immediately. Um, measurement in its current state falls immediately. Uh, kind of replaced by this this new thing, SK Ad Network, uh, that is new, it's in a new version, but actually it was released a little while ago to almost no fanfare uh, or even notice actually, uh, outside of just a, a couple like really, really, uh, you know, in-depth industry analysts, uh, but it's now received its its upgrade. That will be the, the de facto standard for measurement. Measurement in its current form completely goes away. So everything goes dark basically in terms of marketing. That's so optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's more optimistic than Eric Super, who announced this with like a big atom bomb explosion on his <laughs> stories. <laughs> exactly. It gets pretty amped up as far as the, the rhetoric. And, and look, it is, it's a major, major uh, uh, change in the industry. And the industry has moved through these changes in the past. So it, it's not like everything's going to completely fall apart. Um, People will innovate. People will kind of build new solutions that are more privacy focused is the key. Uh, right now, we're, we're in a world where we're not worried about privacy as an ad tech industry and, and as a, uh, just a mobile industry in general. And uh, GDPR and, and kind of legal barriers have cropped up. Uh, and, and personally, I think those are just absolutely necessary uh, and long, long overdue. But as an industry, it's still taken us a while to catch up. This is kind of the the nail in the coffin, if you will. Uh, maybe not apocalyptic, but definitely, definitely significant. Yeah, and interesting. We had a question as well about fingerprinting, and 
according to the letter of the law for Apple, fingerprinting is tracking. And therefore, if you haven't asked yeah. for permission to track, you know, you're going to have issues there as well. Uh, Peggy, right. moving on to you. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to just, you know, cover the stuff at the top. So I want to step back because you are focused on measurement, but hey, you also have a company doing that as well. Metric works, right? And you've been doing this longer than we've been worried about iOS 14. So there's something there, some sort of history. Just give me a brief background about your company. You founded it for a reason. Now you have a mission. What is it? That's right. Yeah. So Metric Works has been around for uh, for a while, but in like kind of various forms. So I, mm -hmm. I was a co-founder of Tap Heaven. We were originally a DSP, mm -hmm. uh, building kind of solutions to make marketing more effective. Is, is what I've been doing now for the better part of a decade. Um, mm -hmm. Tap Heaven was eventually sold to a Norwegian company called Target Circle. And then a couple of years later, it was actually broken back out into a separate subsidiary called Metricworks. Um, kind of a lot of my same Tap Heaven team is with me uh, within Metricworks. And and certainly we we picked up some, some great resources from the Target Circle umbrella all, along the way, but yeah, so over that time, it's just about making mobile marketers more effective. Uh, and that in the early days was kind of um, DSP and, and RTB, which just took way longer than I personally expected to pick up on mobile. Uh, so it was a play that was way too early. Uh, learned my lesson there. And we, uh, we've since shifted into automation at a, at a greater scope. So rather than bidding on those impressions, those, you know, um, really strong prediction algorithms, understanding conversion rates, we kind of went a level up to essentially automate all of mobile user acquisition across all channels. So uh, that's where we've been for a while now. And as of uh, about nine months ago, we started a research project trying to understand the limitations of the last touch attribution model hmm. and kind of figuring out how to get around those limitations. And that took us into a variety of paths, including econometrics, uh, including incrementality testing. Uh, but you know, several months later, we found out that the IDFA indeed was disappearing. So it just uh, it just happened yeah. to be a a really solid uh, set of, of of timing, basically. Very, very good timing. I mean, they often say about yeah. startups, right? Timing is everything, right? <laughs> Maybe even more important than the actual idea in some cases. So true. Right? Um, Let's dive into it then. So in iOS 14, um, you already said, you know, stuff goes dark, right? There's a lot of things that you won't be able to do. But as a marketer, especially as a retention marketer, you need to understand retention. You need to understand your daily average users. You have app analytics for that, of course. But you need to understand LTV and ROAS and stuff like that. You can get that at certain levels. What, what's that look like in iOS 14 in your view? Yeah, that's a great question. So app analytics, like you said, it kind of covers part of the retention um, picture, but it's an incomplete uh, piece of the picture, right? Because if you're looking at retention, if you're looking at retaining users, you're looking at making sure that your app or your product is optimized to you know, engage users and retain them, of course. And app analytics, no problem there. IDFV will be your your go-to proxy to understand users or devices. Um, the thing is, there's another part of retention, which is understanding where those users are being sourced from. If you don't have a great idea of where your users are being sourced from and you're not uh, ac acquiring quality users, your retention is, is going to be uh, severely hampered anyway. So that is the key here. When IDFA disappears, it's understanding where your users are being sourced from and from each media source and and to, to you know, hopefully fairly uh, deep levels of granularity from a media source perspective, where are the high retention users being sourced from? Uh, where are the high value users being sourced from? That is a question that will no longer be able to be answered, at least in, in the way we're used to today, uh, as soon as IDFA disappears. So very much it's about a different approach, and you're going to talk about that approach in a moment, but it's also about a mindset. I mean, what you're basically saying is that that search for those highly valuable users, the, the, the probability, propensity, propensity, that they will retain at a high level is gone. Right. Yeah. So, so, so elaborate on that, because what does that mean? Does that mean that I 
have to do it completely differently or I need to tweak it slightly. So in this new world, we're going to mm -hmm. all as marketers end up with SK ad network, replacing the glue that MMPs used to provide uh, from the standpoint of attribution, right? Where are my users being sourced from? And when that happens, that, that change carries with it a bunch of limitations that are really limitations inherent in SK ad network. So number one, SK ad network, you got a hundred campaign IDs. Some people are running thousands of campaign IDs per media source. So that's already a massive limitation right there in granularity, right. if you if you will. Uh, also, SK ad network, um, uh, it, it has a, a problem of data completeness also, if you will. So number one, the install date of users is obfuscated for privacy reasons. So you never really know when users install, even though you get an install post back that you can count. You don't know really when that user installed. Cohorting KPIs by install date, that also evaporates. Yeah. And then finally, from a data completeness standpoint, you're only measuring a single conversion value. And, and that happens to be the six bit number basically uh, that most people are thinking of as an ID, uh, like some sort of event ID, you know, level completions in a game, something like that. Others are thinking more of buckets like LTV buckets or revenue buckets, maybe even retention buckets, but you only get 64 of them. And th those are even limited in scope just because you get this rolling 24 hour timer. That yeah. first 24 hour period is so critical now because if, it, if that first 24 hour period elapses and the user doesn't come back into your app, giving your app code a chance to reset that timer with, a, yeah. with an increase in the, the conversion value ID, it automatically stops and fires off that, that post back to the attributed network. And that's all the data you get. So there's gonna be a little bit of tail wagging the dog scenario where companies yeah. I'm talking to are already looking at this from a product perspective. Yes. How do we manage our product in order to make sure that within those first 24 hours, which is the only period we're guaranteed to know about, uh, that we get as much information about the value of the user as possible. Uh, but in general, that SK ad network um, solution is going to be the only solution replacing that normal last touch glue. But even that has problems. As I alluded to before, we've been kind of cozy in this sort of, uh, this blanket that is more of like an emperor's new blanket, if you will. It's, no, it's nothing, basically. We're just kind of uh, uh, wrapping ourselves up in nothing and it's comforting. Last Touch has been around forever um, and, and it's kind of really well aligned with how we buy users as well in mobile. Uh, usually user acquisition is billed on a CPI or cost per install basis. So Last Touch just kind of made sense from that perspective as well. But in general, Last Touch has so many problems with it. Even SK Ad Network, an implementation of Last Touch has severe limitations from what we're used to today. Even today's solutions that are all based on Last Touch are severely crippled simply due to the issues with Last Touch. Mostly the fact that Last Touch, you're looking at the device level. So number one, you can't understand true incrementality. Hmm. You're only understanding a single touch, the last one in the conversion path, which could be made up of dozens of touches. Yeah. That last touch might not actually have very much incremental value at all. Absolutely. That's a huge issue. I mean, um, because anybody who, who knows how they actually buy something or install an app or anything like that knows that there's multiple factors that come into play most times and sometimes the last one is by far the least important. It's just a little trigger. It's just a little reminder or something like that. So there's definite issues for that. Um, there's lots of issues as well. It's interesting. I'm just going to riff for a little bit because you talked about companies re-architecting their apps and their app, app experience in order to ensure they get as many touches in that first 24 hours after install. So they get as good data as they can during that only period when they're actually guaranteed to get data. And that's, that's right. really interesting because will you sacrifice long-term retention for immediate engagement? Um, and, and will that have long-term issues or will immediate engagement have good things uh, to say or, or to influence your long-term retention? Who knows? We don't know those things right now. It's going to depend on implementations of how people do that, but it's going to be super interesting to study that. 
I want to ask you about kind of a workaround. Uh, you're proposing a workaround that's sort of a top-down approach, sort of your focus on delivering a new kind of future-proof mobile measurement solution. Talk about how you plan on approaching it. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, three quarters ago, basically, we started this research project just trying to solve the problems inherent in last touch attribution. Uh, the fact that honestly, the the we're in measurement, we're focused on the causal effect between media spend and incremental value, right? And incrementality, incremental value or uplift, whatever you want to call it, is so critical even more now and as time has gone on, because across all these media sources we're used to as mobile marketers, there is such a high overlap in audience, right? And that's just increased over the years. Back in the day, these ad networks would actually have the notion of exclusive inventory. I mean, that's that's yeah. just not a thing anymore, right? They're, they're more or less like uh, glorified DSPs, you can you could essentially say, um, all targeting the same exact inventory, the same exact, uh, sorry, not same inventory, but the same exact audience, right? So over the years, as the audience overlap has increased across all these media sources, incrementality has become more and more relevant uh, because you're just adding touches to, to this, you know, kind of stream uh, the analogy I hear often is the uh, the fishing poles in the in the stream, right? It's the same group of fish. Each media source you're adding is just another fishing pole, and the the critical thing here is not really to optimize your marketing based on uh, what the the last touch happens to be, the ads that happen to get the last touch. It's really optimizing the media mix, which is optimizing the perfect number of fishing poles and the perfect mix. Of fishing poles in that stream. Um, and that's been really the key for a long time. It's just not been really recognized by the industry as what your job should be as a marketer. So what we're doing is saying, okay, let's fix that problem. The nice thing about it is it just so happens to be privacy centric as well, if you will, simply be, or privacy uh, compatible, let's say, simply because it only works with aggregated data. So <clears throat> early on, we identified two main branches or approaches, if you will. Number one is a top-down regression-based measurement solution uh, where we're using econometrics, we're using uh, techniques similar to media mix modeling, but it's, it's, it's actually not quite that. Uh, it's, it's, you could think of it as taking media mix modeling and applying it, adapting it to measurement, something that it's just not meant to, uh, to do right now. The other thing, though, is when you're looking at, at regression, you can't just have a standalone regression-based solution to measurement, specifically because while it's able to do a lot of cool things, top down and incorporates everything. So clearly it can it can understand incrementality, something that a bottom up or device level solution like these last touch attribution models we've been so used to just can never do. When you're operating at the device level, you can't understand all the other touches that, that happened on this device um, based on the entire media mix overall. So number one, you can understand incrementality, but number two, you're, you're a little hamstrung from the sense of you can only understand based on regression correlations mm -hmm. and when we're talking about measurement you're worried about the causal effect between ad spend and incremental value so you you need something else and what we looked at originally was incrementality testing and i truly believe that is the more or less gold standard in understanding the true ground truth of incrementality but it was also hamstrung due to uh, the IDFA deprecation. So when you're talking about incrementality testing, what you're doing is you're really running a randomized controlled trial like you would in like a pharmaceutical company. Um, just taking a population, dividing it up into two separate groups randomly, that's key here, um, into a control group and an experiment group or a treatment group or, or a test group, whatever you wanna call it. And the that that, Treatment group is the one that sees ads. The control group, group does not. There's a variety of things that people have been looking into that type of thing for a long time. Uh, right. In fact, Facebook already offers uh, that type of incrementality testing as these uplift tests. Um, and it uses ghost ads. It, it's a really good way of doing it. There's a ton we can talk about just as far as incrementality testing alone, honestly. But the bottom line. 
actually, Brian, you know, to be fair, I mean, that's a, that's a topic of its own. And it you're is. talking about that modeling. I want to just understand when you say, you know, this sort of like backwards engineering, we're looking for a causal effect. Can you just give me a little bit of practical understanding here of what that means, what I'm looking for in behavior, in measurement, because I can't measure very much anymore, right? Yeah, no, that's right. So so you you have these two sides, a regression side, if you were an econometric side, and like an incrementality or experimentation side, right? On the regression side, it's actually pretty straightforward. What econometrics is, is simply looking at historical trends, looking at historical data, usually in a time series, and understanding the historical correlations between these dependent variables, whatever could be affecting whatever you're measuring and the, the independent variable, whatever you are trying to measure, right? Mm -hmm. So when, you're, you, when you apply econometrics to m marketing or marketing measurement in particular, uh, which is obviously what we're looking at specifically, you're taking all these various things that could be affecting whatever you're trying to measure. In this case, it's uplift. Let's say it's uplift in terms of retention right? Uh, based on the theme of the show. I think that's a reasonable way to go. So uh, we're looking at retention as our, our incremental uplift. What are the things that could affect that in terms of marketing? It's ad spend across all your various media sources at hopefully quite granular levels, campaigns, ad sets, down to even publisher apps when you're talking about SDK networks, um, countries, all these dimensions, right? Where's my ad spend going? Where are my impressions coming from? Even where are my clicks coming from? Uh, you can incorporate so many other things, trying to proxy like latent demand, uh, trying to understand what is my underlying demand for my product that really isn't being affected uh, at all by the, the my media spend, right? Uh, you can incorporate so many different things. If you're a weather app, you can incorporate weather, right, mm -hmm. into the model. All these things can be dependent variables, we call them, and that all, interacts in certain ways over time and correlates or doesn't with the actual dependent variable in this example retention so you might see certain days where you spend less on certain media sources and there's a a constant correlation with a decrease in retention whereas on days where you happen to increase spend or increase imp impressions on those specific media sources there's a correlated increase or improvement in retention. And you find those correlations and you can measure the correlations, you can uh, figure out the uncertainty in the correlations, and you can look at those correlations very specifically at each individual media source level. And you can figure out kind of where they are and, and really allocate retention installs uh, uplift to uh, the various media sources in that, in that fashion. It sounds like a um, something that requires a very high level of data science. Yeah. Um, and I'm, 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 what I'm remembering right now is the Arthur C. Clarke quote, which is that any sufficiently advanced science is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> and honestly, Help us that understand was, how uh, this is not magic. <laughs> that was actually one of the, the keys going into this from a product perspective or a strategy perspective really, uh, starts there. Um, how do you take econometrics, which, you know, obviously large consumer packaged goods firms have been using for, I mean, honestly, like a few decades now um, and, and successfully not for measurement, but for other purposes, including what if analysis and forecasting. But how do you take this concept that has been used successfully in other industries, but apply it to measurement, something that traditionally has been looked at as very, very deterministic, even though, as I mentioned, it's it's been deterministic, but been, you know, a false truth, if you will, uh, or a false reality. Um, but at least it's understandable. How do you take something that everyone has been able to understand, last touch gets all the credit, and, and find a way to apply something that is just not super understandable, like regression? Uh, even though regression at its core is sort of understandable, you're building this pretty complex model and, and trying to divvy up all the, the various, you know, installs yeah. or, or retention across across all the media sources like that. It's it's a difficult problem. The the main way we we try to solve that is number one, trying to uh, depict it in a pretty understandable way. Retention is just a bunch of variables affecting something you're trying to measure. How do we figure out what the correlations are between those two things over time? And you can actually translate that, that's regression, you can translate that into a pretty reasonable measurement methodology. 
if if there's a high correlation, you're probably getting a lot of installs truly or a lot of value out of those media sources where, the, where it's correlated and, and likewise the opposite on the other side. Well, we all know that correlation means causation. Um, so <laughs> I'm, jo I'm joking there. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah. But well, that's, that's a critical point, though. Obviously, it doesn't. So that's yeah. the second aspect here where you can't just rely on, on correlation or regression or, or econometrics. You have to have some sort of experimentation process where yes. you're validating and enriching those models. And uh, the, the way you do that is... It, I wish it was incrementality testing. And I'm hoping that somebody eventually figures that out, even with the lack of IDFAs. The big problem there is, as I was mentioning, you need this big population that you can split randomly into a control group and a treatment group. Without IDFAs and a pretty sizable chunk of them, there's no real way to do that. Yeah. So IDFA type of creation really crushed incrementality testing. Uh, but there are still other ways. In just the most naive approach, you can just do a time series sort of uh, experiment. In other words, you could just turn off some traffic yeah. and based on that date, you can kind of understand, okay, what is the decrease in, yeah. in uplift? And, uh, certainly that should, as long as all the variables are, are controlled, uh, that should, you know, give you the ground truth of incrementality as well. But there's a lot of variables that you have to account Which, for there. And yeah. we used something algorithmically to deal with that, but uh, yeah, that, that's very going challenging as well, right? I mean, if you want to do incrementality testing, if you want to like do some ghost ads or in, in some way like that, you know, you have to, there, there's extra spend you've got to do, or if you can do it by turning off sources, then you've got to have, you know, balls of steel because maybe all of our installs are coming from this source and I'm turning it off and my growth rate tanks and my boss comes down and yells at me, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so it's, there's it's a, really there's a couple key things there. You're exactly right. You know, nailed the, the issues when an incrementality testing can be costly. Ghost ads is a way to, to take the price down, but it, it still has its own issues. You need a lot of help from the channel and you kind of have to trust the channel. Um, in, in kind of a more of a time series experiment, like I explained, you're just kind of turning something off. It reverses from a, a dollar cost to an opportunity cost. Yeah. And yeah. the key there is running tests that have as little opportunity cost as possible while maximizing information gain. So you kind of need a, um, your a cake methodology. And it too. I understand, very simple, that, not a problem. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, and, and really the, the way you can do it, so you're, you're, you're hitting on, on you know, some, some truths, honestly. You, you know, you're, you're trying to, as best as possible, have your cake and eat it too. Uh, and not, not every case is that possible, but what you can do is you can use data science to kind of rank experiments in mm -hmm. order of information gain to opportunity cost ratio. So the the advertiser, the marketer, the game publisher is the one that can kind of prioritize those experiments that you proposed in some sort of some sort of ranked order, understand, analyze each experiment, and then execute them uh, when it's when it's you know uh, not so prohibitive to do so. So yeah, in general, we uh, we kind of use a methodology like that, try to limit the experiments as much as possible, make them granular. Yeah. Don't turn off an entire ad set on Facebook, turn off just the German traffic or the, the Italian traffic and only for a, a predefined amount of time to hit statistical significance. And then even then it, it's not perfect, right? The time that you turn that off could have coincided with COVID-19, the next, you know, uh, the next big spike or something like that, uh, that, that threw it off. There's no way to control for all variables. So then you need something like uh, causal inference is, is the name of the, the group of algorithms that kind of takes a look at, okay, let's try to forecast what should have continued happening based on previous trends. And when we turned it off, we can compare that to what actually did happen and make sure that some weird variable didn't screw up the experiment. Here's where we get into the real magic, Peggy. <laughs> this, is, this is it, Brian, Yeah, because I'm listening to you and I'm saying, yes, I fully get this, really appreciate it. Most of my friends and colleagues are in very small UA teams, and we want to leave them with something rather than all the heavy lifting here, right, Brian? Because that sounds like, oh, just go out and hire another army of data scientists <laughs> um, or, you know, or whatever, it sounds really tough. So I'd love to have some examples of one, you know, why bother, right? So it's gotta be like, 
a business benefit to do all this. And then you've been working with clients, you know, you've been doing this. So I'd like to, you know, get back to the practical here. We've been up here a little bit in the big picture. And I'd like to get down to the <laughs> idea of like, you know, a UA team. I was talking to a guy at a company, great guy. And I'm like, you know, how big is your UA team? He says, I'm it, right? Really <laughs> smart guy, really good company, very niche app. So you're able to do that. You're able to be very focused with, you know, do more with less. What are you able to do with your clients? Yeah, great question. So uh, so that's kind of like how it works at a, at a deeper level and all the various pieces required to do this. But I think the, the overall message is once IDFAs go dark, gone are the days when you can really do marketing, you can optimize retention, uh, you can you can really optimize much of anything outside of your own product wow. without strong data science, because you're left with some very, very weak, incomplete and, and just really uh, uh, crappy signals, uh, which are mostly incorporated in into SK ad network. Uh, so it this IDFA deprecation has essentially increase the burden, especially on the smaller app developers, uh, because now you do need this data science. Um, and to be perfectly honest, again, you needed it all along simply because what you were used to measuring in a really simple way was not actually truly uh, a great picture of, of incrementality. Uh, but in general, at least you could, you had something and it was easily understandable. Those days are gone. So uh, the way that we're looking at this is we have a data science team and uh, we've been doing this type of uh, these types of algorithms for a while in other forms right ltv prediction uh in terms of and then automation and bid optimization uh so we've essentially put this together in order to essentially democratize it make it available for everyone even those especially those maybe without the resources for a data science team so it, it's making these concepts approachable in a kind of a pre-packaged form. Uh, but certainly we have, as far as practical examples, we have been uh, working hard for uh, over a month now on our betas. Uh, we have this beta program that we set up, uh, certainly with some of our existing cus customers using some of our other products. Uh, but we're also, uh, over the last couple of weeks, have started pulling in external uh, companies that we're interested in working with uh, into that beta program. And we're we're getting some really interesting results. Uh, but the bottom line is the, the overall business benefit to every single beta participant and certainly our future customers of this product uh, when it's when it's released in full is the ability to keep the lights on when IDFAs go dark. Mm -hmm. When all the devices kind of disappear from your purview from the standpoint as a marketer, right? Uh, in terms of tracking specifically, you get to keep the lights on and you don't just get to keep the lights on in some limited way, like SCAD networks trying to pr provide. Your lights stay on at the same brightness that they are today, basically, right? You get to keep all the uh, cohorted KPIs, cohorted by install date that you're used to today, retention, of course, uh, but that also includes uh, revenue, LTV, ROAS, um, and you still get to measure them at the granularity that you're used to today. So not just those 100 campaign IDs uh, that SKI Network allows, but uh, all the various granularities that you're used to today, country, campaign, ad set or ad group, depending on the channel, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, the real benefit here is basically just being able to measure as you're doing today with the massive boost of tr measuring true incrementality rather than just last touch. So let's talk about this next few months here. Uh, we know Apple is um, finalizing or fully implementing all the privacy parts of iOS 14 sometime in 2021. We don't know when. It could be January, it could be December. Most likely, my guess is sometime in spring. And frankly, my guess is that Apple wasn't ready either. <laughs> the ecosystem wasn't ready, but from what I'm hearing in a couple different places, Apple wasn't totally ready either, and SCAD Network had some significant issues, even with the limited feature set that it offers. But we have this chunk of time. It might be three months, it might be six months. How should marketers use this chunk of time? Honestly, by not just relaxing. And there's a significant <laughs> <Come on>. number, <laughs> and it, it feels great. We all just got this like 
this uh, death sentence and execution. then all of a sudden it was lifted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you want to relax, you know, you were, you were headed for the block and all of a sudden it was, it, everything was gone and it feels really, really good. And I know a lot of marketers were, were jumping up for joy. Obviously you can't, you, you have to stop jumping for joy at some point because the winners I personally believe are those that are using this time and maximizing their preparedness basically because this isn't a stay of execution indefinitely that execution is still coming so the winners out of all this uh, some some players are just damaged beyond repair honestly retargeting they're going to have it really really tough apple just clarified their stance even on sharing email addresses and things like that you still have to have that opt-in so there's there's a real big problem in terms of of some of these players but the marketers that win are going to be those that really maximize utilize this time by exploring especially within measurement measurement powers everything else so especially within within measurement taking this time to understand their measurement apparatus of the future how is it going to look it can't ju just be sk ad network it's just not going to happen i know a lot of people are hoping that apple just miraculously you know, installs all these things in the SK ad network last sec second where they totally, you know, destroy their original purpose because, of because Apple really center. cares about marketing measurement. It's very, oh, very much Apple to have marketing measurement that really. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've heard people that believe that the stay of execution was was really the the great work, the cries of the industry. I'm pretty sure Apple barely even heard those cries being a two trillion dollar giant that we they're so far into the clouds, we can barely even see them. So there this is coming and and as an industry, we're not going to be able to do anything about it. SK Ad Network is not going to solve the issues just because by increasing granularity, increasing the amount of post install data that you get outside of that single conversion value we get now, that just makes it easier and easier as you add data points to identify a single user again. Mm -hmm. They specifically don't want that. That's yep. the whole reason why it was designed this way. So hoping that Apple just installs all these huge feature updates in the SK ad network is just uh, an exercise in futility. What you really need to do is understand SK ad network is going to be one signal, a very incomplete signal, but at least it's going to be a really reliable signal for that last touch in the conversion path. None of the other touches, but the last touch, it's going to be very reliable for that. You need something else though. And it could be a variety of things, something you can build in house. Uh, a company like ours obviously is trying to democratize uh, solutions that that put a bunch of things together in order to uh, get the job done. But you need to be utilizing this time to make sure you can measure your data when the lights go out. Totally agree with that. On the reliability, I have a post coming out, coming out uh, soon about three areas of uh, potential fraud in SKAD network. Uh, mm -hmm. So stay tuned on that. But I'll turn it over to Peggy for the close. Yeah, it's so optimistic here. The fraud we're going to have. <laughs> you know, all you can hope to do is keep the lights on. Whatever happened to setting the bar or moving the <laughs> This is this is great, Brian. I love a dose of common sense and hard truth, uh, even if it's hard to swallow <laughs> sometimes. I'm also trying to riff a little bit in my mind here, uh, John, you know, thinking about those products. I mean, how needy is my app going to be now, right? It's like, oh, you downloaded me, and now I need to get on. <laughs> I mean... It's a little bit, you know, women don't like needy things anyway. And now this this app is going to be needy at the They don't? The first, well, <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> in the first day, it's like the first day. Uh, anyway. I think I, you're right. We're going to all be inundated with stuff on that first day we download an app now. It's it's, it's going to change the, the onboarding experience of apps for sure. Peggy, that. I might go away from all this measurement crap and just try and build a freaking good product. <laughs> like, who cares about measurement? I'm just going to build something everybody wants. And then <laughs> yeah, they want it the first day, all the touch points, everything lines up. You you know, it's gravy, right? But Brian, we do have to close. It's been a great show. Learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, and thanks for joining us on Retention Masterclass. Although when retention is no longer possible, John, we'll have to think of a different name. <laughs> it's exactly. always possible. It may be in product possible. and it will impact your measurement of your marketing and other things like that, but it will change. Yeah, that's right. That, that's a good point. You'll always at least be able to continue uh, your product strategy. Yeah. That's your the one thing under your control. 
Brian, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been a blast. It has yeah. been a lot of fun for everybody else. Peggy already said it, but thank you for joining us on Retention Masterclass. It's been our pleasure to host you. Whatever platform you're on, hey, like, subscribe, share, maybe comment, whatever. If you love the podcast, rate it, review it. That'd be a massive help. And of course, that's a wrap. And you'll be reading show notes. I mean, John's website, my website, you'll find out more. And until next time, hey, we're here. Keep well, keep safe. This is Peggy Unsalt signing off for Retention Masterclass. Thank you so much.